welcome back. This is the Northwest Nuclear Evening Show with uh, your host, Carl Greninger, and a merry band of marshmallows. We're in our marshmallow suits. We'll continue to amaze and thrill you tonight. We've got um, some presentations, and then we're going to review the state of our, um, what do they call it? We haven't given this thing a name yet. I kind of call it a COVID oven. I called it a uh, uh, UVC oven. We ought to we ought to give it some kind of a name. <clears throat> anyway, something technical sounding. Yeah. So uh, we ought to have a name contest. That would that would do it. So anyway, the um, COVID blaster. The COVID blaster. <laughs> COVID buster, <laughs> like Ghostbusters, you know, anyway, um, on, along the same lines, um, we're going to be finishing it up tonight. It is uh, uh, operational, and uh, we'll be doing a little bit of testing with it and uh, getting some additional measurements, and uh, we're also working on... Uh, resolving some problems with cameras so that we can get our uh, uh, audience online. Um, we're moving to a, a face-up camera sy sy system. However, it looks like we may have to go to Zoom to do it. Uh, we're not absolutely certain yet. We're just trying all the various options so that we can get the widest amount of equipment to work on the configuration as possible. So that's where we're at. Uh, your master of ceremonies tonight for the presentations is David. He's going to come up here and uh, introduce, and then we'll uh, move through the presentations. Anybody else here and clicking in their... Okay, mine went away. Getting static and clicking and all sorts of things. Uh, good evening. Tonight, we're going to have our people on hand presenting. We said before that this is the week, um, the month of women's history being celebrated uh, nationally. And so we're going to take a look at four more uh, famous women scientists. Why are we singling out women? Well, because for many years, hardly anybody who was in school or teaching or learning knew anything about women scientists, except for Madame Curie. And everybody, uh, they were just pretty much ignored. And yet, they're extremely important people and have made really significant contributions. Like last week when I talked about Hedy Lamarr and the fact that her uh, invention of the uh, frequency skipping led to our development of the internet, to our development of the uh, cell phone, of GPS, very important discoveries. So we're going to hear tonight about four more ladies of science. Um, I do want to mention that I sent out last Saturday to everybody a list of 38 women that they could choose from, and eight of you have still not made a choice. So I don't know why that is, but if I don't hear from you tomorrow, on Saturday at some time, then I'll just go ahead and assign you somebody. And it may not be somebody you'd really like to look at, or might not be in the field that you're interested in. So I encourage you to go ahead and make your choice. Um, so uh, looks like we're going to start tonight with Caleb. And 
Carl, where's the... Uh... Caleb is going to come up there and uh, plug in. Okay, this is your official PowerPoint presenter, right? So, Let's see, so. Oh. and the button closest to you is the one that moves it forward. Okay. Oh, there you go. All right. Okay, so uh, I decided to do my presentation on Gertrude Elion, who was a really great scientist and it's pretty interesting to research about. Okay, so just a little bit of background about her. She was born on January 23rd, 1918. Her parents were both East uh, immigrants from Eastern Europe, the New York. Um, when she was 15, her grandfather died of cancer, which was important because later in life she became really interested in curing cancer because she was close to her grandfather. Um, during the Great Depression in 1929, her father went bankrupt, um, which meant that she entered Hunter's College, which was a free college, um, because she did really well in high school, uh, and there she majored in chemistry. Um, so, in terms of her professional life, while she was at Hunter's College, uh, she was a teacher and she taught biochemistry to nurses, however she lost that job after only three months. Um, then she took a job as a lab assistant, but she didn't get any pay until one and a half years when she started making $20 a week. Uh, while she was doing that, she went to grad school when, where she was the only woman in her class. Um, in her biography, though, she said that she didn't really care about that that much because she was so interested in what she was learning about chemistry. Because of that background in chemistry, she worked in food quality control for one and a half years. Um, however, she quit that job because she didn't feel like she was learning anything. Um, then she went and worked at Johnson & Johnson for six months, but that lab shut down. Um, and finally, she uh, reached out to George Hitchings, who was a pretty major player in the medicine world at that time, um, and was especially studying microbiology. Um, so with her background in chemistry, uh, she, she used that to kind of solve some medicine problems. Um, during that time, she went to night school to get her doctorate degree, but eventually uh, there wasn't enough time for both, so, he, so she had to decide between her job and school, and she chose to stay at her job. Um, which eventually turned out to be a good choice because she was promoted to be the head of the Department of Experimental Therapy. Um, so while she was at George Hitching's lab, uh, she developed drugs to treat <clears throat> major diseases like malaria and AIDS. Um, she especially researched purines, especially adenine and guanine. Hitchings and Elion, they worked on preventing purines from entering the metabolic pathway, which stopped cell growth, uh, which is super important in things like cancer, because that's how they reproduce. Um, she published or co-published 225 papers, um, and with her chemistry background, she created diaminopurine and thioguanine, which blocked DNA production. Uh, she used her background in chemistry to solve traditionally biological problems. So because of all this research, um, she did get many awards. She received the Nobel Prize in Medicine, which she split between uh, herself, George Hitchings, and another lab assistant. Um, it turns out that it was a good idea for her to quit school, uh, uh, to quit her doctorate degree, because she was awarded an honorary doctorate degree from Harvard, Brown, University of Michigan, and George Washington University. Because of her interest in cancer and her work in that field, uh, she went on the board of directors for both the Division of Cancer Treatment and the National Cancer Advisory Board. Um, so some takeaways I have uh, from learning about her uh, that I think are pretty important is that she made learning her biggest priority. No matter uh, where she was, she always made sure that she was learning. Uh, she quit her job in food safety because she didn't feel like she was learning, and she stayed in school during many of her jobs. Another thing is that she didn't always stay in her field of expertise. Um, she was adept at chemistry, but she chose to study microbiology with George Hitchings, and it turned out that those two coincided really well, and that's what uh, gave George Hitchings an edge in the medicine field. Um, and then also she took a lot of jobs before finding one that fit, which I think is important because um, there's time that we have before we need to, we need to choose what we, need, what we want to do. 
So I think that's good. Um, and here's a couple of sources if you want to learn more. Her life was pretty interesting. So. That's my presentation. Thank you, Caleb. Very, very good. Anybody have any questions for Caleb? Evan, you're up next. I do want to mention, show respect for your classmates, pay close attention, no video games or other things should be going on. Okay, there's your clicker. Just like press down or? Yeah, the, okay. the, the, the down button should take your slides deck forward. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth Blackwell. Take, so. take a look at yourself so you can see that you're kind of standing in front of her. Yeah, go to the side a little bit. That's how you keep track of where you are and your slides are right down here. <clears throat> uh, so Elizabeth Blackwell was a, went into the medical field in the 1800s and she was considered to be the first kind of woman to, well, she was the first uh, person to get a doctorate in a medical degree, and she was considered to be the first woman to kind of like get women into science. So, for what is done or learned by one class of women becomes by virtue of their common womanhood, the property of all women. So, known by her father as Little Shy and her friend as Beth, Elizabeth Blackwell was born on February 3rd, 1821 in Counterslip, Bristol, England. She was the sister of eight other children. She was born to her father Samuel Blackwell, a prosperous sugar refiner, and to her mother Hannah Lane, who came from a family of merchants. Growing up in her, phone, her home, she received an equal education to her brother, which was considered to be quite rare occurrence during this time period because women weren't seen as equal to being men. Due to the circumstances, her family would soon leave England to pursue a life in America. And this is a portrait of the young version. Due to a fire that burned down her father's sugar refinery in England, she moved to New York with her family when she was 11 in August of 1832. Her family was incredibly anti-slavery due to their faith as Quakers, and their voyage to America allowed their father to attend anti-slavery meetings and fairs. In fact, her family despised slavery to the point where they refused to eat anything with added sugar. Due to her father's refinery falling on hard times in 1837, he sold it and his family moved to the rising town of Cincinnati with the goal of growing sugar beets, intending to compete with a slavery-intensive sugar industry. Unfortunately, her father ends up falling and dying to a fever three weeks after they move. And this is a quote from her. It is not easy to be a pioneer, but oh, is it fascinating. After her father's death, her older sisters Anna and Marion had started a school in their home to help with the costs. After it closes in 1842, Elizabeth continues teaching until 1845 when her life changes suddenly with a visit from a dying friend. Her friend, silly dying and close to her end, tells Elizabeth that if she were able to be treated by a woman, her illness might have been more bearable. This moment stays in Elizabeth's mind because, and is historically known for her inspiration for going to the medical field because previously she actually had never, cons never considered it. She considered um, the medical field to be like kind of dirty and sanitary and she disliked having to work with like illness. Elizabeth taught her final days of school between 1845 and 1847, also attending to teach slaves but finding out that it was illegal. She ends up finding a loophole that allows her to teach them in Sunday schools. In Asheville, North Carolina, she homed with the Reverend John Dixon who allowed her to study his medical books. She also homed with the Reverend Dixon's brother, Samuel, who encouraged and tutored her in hopes that she would continue chasing her dream. She applied to tens of medical schools, only seeming to make it into the Geneva Medical College, who had accepted her application as a joke, supposedly assuming that the application was a prank from a rival college. 
the only woman student in the school, Geneva Medical School didn't accept another woman until the 1860s. She was, to no one's surprise, outcasted and stepped around awkwardly as she started at the school. Some gentlemen would have preferred that she wasn't hearing about learning about the same things as them, but she insisted that she be excluded from nothing and her wishes were granted. In fact, actually, after a certain amount of time, she was able to, to earn the uh, respect of her peers and colleagues. She took a short, short stint away at a charity hospital for her residence, where she again faced discrimination, this time from patients. But she came away with valuable, practical knowledge in treating patients. Her graduating thesis, which dealt with the typhus and the importance of hygiene and cleanliness, was one of her lifelong passions and a reminder of the moment where she decided to enter the medical field, because during this time, hygiene was not considered as really as important as it is today. She received her medical degree in 1849 at the age of 28, becoming the first woman to do so, and her sister followed, followed in her steps soon after in 1854. Recognizing her lack of experience, Elizabeth would choose to work alongside other doctors rather than work independently. She would enroll at the, at the Paris Maternity Hospital, where she would work until 1850. She then moved to UK's capital, beginning her internship with Dr. James Paget, who she regarded as a close friend. Her work would then lead her to setting up her own practice at the age of 30, due to the fact that nobody would employ her on account of her being a woman. Her fame began to grow, and her practice slow, slowly became more credible as she gave public lectures and educational journals, wrote educational journals. In 1858, she would go on to establish her own infirmary directed towards women and children. This hospital would be run with the help of her sister Emily and a competent physician by the name of Mary. She would go on to tour the UK giving lectures, and she is credited with the inspiration of many young women who would later on go to studying physicians in the medical field and became the first woman on the British Medical Register. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, Blackwell would go on to, go on to train nurses to provide sanitary care for wounded soldiers. And in 1869, Blackwell returned to her birth country permanently, establishing a large practice in London. She would leave her previous uh, practice to her sister Emily. She formed the National Health Society in 1871 to promote better sanitation and would go on to accept the chair, accept the chair of gynecology in 1875 but she was unfortunately forced to step down to the next year due to illness. A prolific writer still, she would continue writing until her retirement, her last book and autobiography being published in 1895. She would pass away from a stroke at the age of 89 on May 31st, 1910. And while she may be gone, her accomplishments in the medical field will never be forgotten. That's it. Thank you very much. Very good. Are there any questions for him? I just want to add an aside to that. Um, it, it had to be incredibly difficult for her in medical school, being the only woman there, getting no respect from the other doctors. Uh, and her treatment must have been horrible. And, you know, the fact that she got into there because they thought it was a joke, that they were being pranked by another school. Um, my wife went to medical school in the 1980s, and she went to the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. She was in the first class that had more than 50% of their student body was women. And she told me that she felt like she was never, ever treated differently because she was a woman, that she was not discriminated against. And Dr. Blackwell was the person who got that all set up. All right, Caitlin. Okay, can everyone hear me? Um, no, let me go ahead and see if I can adjust your microphone a little bit. Try again. Three, two, one. Okay, let's, let's go with that. Okay. So the scientist I chose was Marie Curie, who I'm sure we've all heard of before. So growing up, she was born on November 7, 1867 in Warsaw, which is in modern day Poland. Her given name was Maria Skodowska. Her dad was named Wladyslav. He was a math and physics instructor. And her mom was Bronislava, who was a teacher. But she died when Marie was 10 due to tuberculosis which made Marie struggle with depression and kind of shaped her religious beliefs. Her siblings were Zosha, Joseph, Bronislava, and Gila. Marie was the youngest of five. She excelled at school as a child, but could not attend the male-only University of Warsaw 
but continued her education at Warsaw's Floating University, which were like a series of underground classes. She made a deal with Bronislava to financially support her while she went to school, and then Bronislava would do the same for Marie after she finished school. After five years of working to support Bronislava, in 1891, Marie left for Paris and enrolled in the Sorbonne, which was when she changed her name to Marie to be, sound more French. She obtained her master's in physics in 1893 and obtained a degree in mathematics in 1894. And there's a picture of her and her siblings. Pierre Curie. Marie and Pierre were introduced to each other by a Polish physicist and professor who had known Marie for some time and supported her through her studies in France. Within a year, Pierre proposed, but Marie said no because she was going back to Poland to work. However, she was denied a place at Krakow University because she was a woman, so Pierre convinced her to return to Paris. On July 26, 1895, they were married. They had two children named Irene and Eve. On April 19, 1901, Pierre suddenly was hit by a horse-drawn vehicle and passed away. On May 13, 1906, she succeeded him as professor at the Sorbonne, and Marie was the first woman professor at the university. So her first Nobel Prize was in 1903. The 1896 discovery of radioactivity by Henry Becquerel inspired Marie and Pierre Curie to further investigate this phenomenon. They examined many substances and minerals for signs of radioactivity and found that the mineral pitch blend was more radioactive than uranium. They concluded that it must contain other radioactive substances. From the mineral, they, able, they extracted two previously unknown elements, which were polonium and radium, which were both radioact more radioactive than uranium. And Marie named polonium in honor of her country of Poland. Marie took a quarter of the 1903 Nobel Prize for Physics, her husband took the other quarter, and then Becquerel took half. Originally, Marie was not included in the nomination, but Pierre complained, and she was added. She was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize. So her second Nobel Prize was in 1911. Marie continued to investigate polonium and radium's properties. In 1910, she successfully produced radium as a pure metal, which proved the new element's existence without doubt. She documented the properties of the radioactive elements and their compounds. Radioactive compounds became important so as sources of radiation in scientific experiments and in the medical field for treating tumors. The Nobel Prize was in chemistry. She was the only woman to win more than one Nobel Prize and the first person to win the award twice. So membership slash development. Around 1911, Curie joined other famous scientists, including Albert Einstein and Max Planck, to attend the first Solvay Cong Congress in Physics and discuss the many, where they discussed the many groundbreaking discoveries in their field. In 1914, she saw completion of, of the building of laboratories for the Radium Institute at the University of Paris. In 1922, she became, an, she became a member of the Academy of Medicine, where she studied the medical applications of her work. She became a member of the International Commission on in Intellectual Cooperation by the Co Council of the League of Nations, which were like a group of scientists and artists grouped together to sh internationally share information and, no and knowledge. She saw the development of the Curie Foundation in Paris and saw the inauguration in 1932 of the Radium Institute in Warsaw. So one of her quotes is, be less curious about people and more curious about ideas. Marie was never really into gossip and spent most of her time in the lab. However, other people would gossip about her. For example, she was spent too, a lot of time in the lab and wasn't able to take care of her kids like other women at the time. However, her kids were properly taken care of by her father-in-law. And also, after she was widowed, she had an affair with one of her students. And since she was widowed, like it was fine, but her student was married and had like four children. So her reputation went down greatly. However, in World War I, her reputation came back up. Throughout World War I, Marie Curie, with the help of her daughter Irene, devoted herself to the use of X-radiography. She championed the use of portable X-ray machines in the field, and these medical vehicles earned the nickname Little Curies. She used her status and fame to kind of ask for donations and go to hospitals and ask for machines. And there's a picture of one of the Little Curies. So her death and after her death. She died July 4th, 1934. She died of aplastic anemia, which was developed due to constant exposure to radiation because it was before people really knew the side effects of radiation. And it was rumored she kept like a 
thing of radium in her pocket. Her ashes. In 1995, her ashes were enshrined in the Pantheon in Paris, where France's greatest minds rest. She was, one, she was the first of five women to receive this honor. And her legacy. Marie was the first woman to do many things and became an inspiration. She broke new ground, especially for women in science. And that's all. Excellent. Any questions for Caitlin? One thing to understand is that when you choose who you're going to do, if you pick somebody you think is going to be easy because there's tons of information out there, you've got to go through tons of information to find out what you're going to say in your five to ten minute presentation. So it can be rather difficult. Correct. And now Christine. <laughs> All right, I did my presentation on Maria Gopert Mayer, a theoretical physicist and Nobel laureate. Uh, Maria was born in 1906 in Prussia, which is now Poland, and she was an only child. Her father was, the, was a sixth generation professor, making her the seventh, and she attended an all girls technical high school. After she entered the University of Göttingen in Germany, where she majored in math, and she earned her PhD in physics because she switched her major after becoming interested in physics, also from the University of Göttingen. She married the American Rockefeller Fellow physical chemist Joseph Edward Mayer, who was actually rooming with her family in Germany when he was working at the University of Göttingen. And she moved back to the U.S. with him and had two children. Uh, and speaking of her uh, subject change, she said, mathematics began to seem too much like puzzle solving. Physics is puzzle solving too, but of puzzles created by nature, not by the mind of man. Upon arriving in the US, she followed her husband to Johns Hopkins University, Columbia University, and the University of Chicago, where she was only a fellow or a volunteer associate professor due to anti-nepotism laws, meaning that she wasn't able to work at the same place her, her husband was. In 1940, she and her husband jointly authored Statistical Mechanics, and after she was given her first paid professional position as a physics teacher at Sarah Lawrence College. After, uh, at Sarah Lawrence College, she was offered a position to be a part-time researcher on the Manhattan Project at Columbia University. Uh, following that, she was a senior physicist at Argonne National Laboratory, where she co-authored a book on elementary theory of nuclear shell structure, which later won her uh, a Nobel Prize in Physics in 1963. Um, she moved. She went to university, or she worked at University of California at San Diego, where she finally became a full professor at age uh, 58. Um, in 65, she was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, her doctoral thesis was on the possible two-photon absorption by atoms, which is a nonlinear optical process in which a molecule simultaneously absorbs two photons to reach an excited state. And only with very high intensity light, uh, like a laser source, does it become probable enough to observe because the lifetime is extremely short. And actually three of her doctoral examiners were Nobel Prize winners themselves. So maybe that um, foreshadowed her Nobel Prize winning. Um, and at the time, the chances of experimentally determining or verifying her thesis was remote, but the development of the laser permitted experimental verification. And in her honor, the two-photon absorption cross-section unit was called the, is called the GM, or the Gopert-Meyer unit. 
and her theoretical results, just based on her doctoral thesis, are directly used today in dermatology, nonlinear microscopy, multi-photon tomography, and photodynamic therapy. Um, at Johns Hopkins University, she wrote a paper in 1935 on double beta decay, which predicted the existence of the two neutrino double beta decay process, which is a rare spontaneous nuclear transition. Uh, this was a very important paper because it represented a direct application of techniques she had used for her doctoral thesis, but in an entirely different context. She received a letter in 1942 uh, asking her to join an important war project at Columbia University. Uh, this important war project was the Manhattan Project, a secret research undertaking on atomic weapons. Uh, this group developed the atomic bomb that was dropped on Japan and ended World War II. She was given a part-time research position at Columbia, and her objective there was to find a way to separate out uranium-235 isotope from natural uranium through chemical and thermodynamic processes such as photochemical reactions. Um, and the process of photochemical reactions was impractical at the time, but since then, development of lasers uh, opens up this possibility. Um, and speaking of her time on the Manhattan Project, she said, we found nothing, and we were lucky. We escaped the searing guilt felt to this day by those responsible for the bomb. After working on the Manhattan Project, she was offered a position in the Argonne National Laboratory, uh, where Enrico Fermi, who was the person that developed the first nuclear reactor, uh, headed a group of 48, 49 scientists. Uh, this group created the world's first controlled, self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction. Um, and U University of Chicago deemed this project too dangerous to conduct on site, so the operations were moved to a nearby forest named Argonne, and that's why they're called the Argonne National Laboratory. And while there, Maria programmed the U.S. Army's ENIAC, which is the first digital computer, and there's a picture um, on the right, and uh, she programmed it to solve critical problems for liquid metal-cooled reactors. And in 1948, she wrote a paper on the nuclear, nuclear shell model and magic numbers, uh, and this paper was what won her, and the research was what won her a Nobel Prize. Um, she developed a mathematical model of the structure of nuclear shells, and it's a similar model to the atomic shell model. Um, this model consists of uh, a nucleus um, and protons and neutrons paired together, arranged in a series of layers that are spinning around their axes and simultaneously orbiting the center of the nucleus. Um, when the spin and orbital motions are aligned, the energy of the particle decreases, but when they are in opposition, the particle's energy increases. And one of the main parts of her essay was magic numbers, which correspond to the largest gaps in energy levels and explain why certain number of nucleons in the nucleus of an atom cause an atom to be extremely stable. And she famously explained this nuclear shell model as a room full of waltzers for their uh, spinning. In 1963, she won the Nobel Prize in Physics for her discoveries concerning nuclear shell structure. She was the second woman and first American woman, second woman after Marie Curie, to win the Nobel Prize in Physics. And she shared this award with Eugene Paul Wigner and J. Hans D. Jensen. And Jensen was also working on the nuclear shell structure and came to similar conclusions, although he was working independently from her. And upon winning the award, she said, winning the prize wasn't half as exciting as doing the work itself. Um, in 1971, she lost her hearing and was paralyzed by a stroke, and she unfortunately died the next year uh, in San Diego at the age of 66. Uh, the American Physical Society created the, a Maria Gopert Mayer Award to honor young female phys physicists, and there is a Venus or a crater on Venus named after her. Um, UC San Diego hold, holds a symposium in her honor, and she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1996. And in 2011, uh, she was put on a U.S. postage stamp. All right, and those are my references. Thank you very much. That was great. And that means that these four students have set a very high bar for the rest of you. So we'll be expecting some really great presentations next Friday.
Testing one, two, three. Okay. Um, that was exciting. Um, I know those of you who are watching out in wonderful internet land are uh, going, okay, they gave oral reports, right? No. We're talking wearing the suit, standing in front of a camera, and utilizing chroma key and teleprompters and a whole bunch of additional things here that are going on that are outside the realm of what you normally do in a classroom. I applaud you for stepping up to a professional television production environment and embracing all the technology that goes on here in the front of the room. Um, I would love to hear some reactions. Um, was it what you expected? Were you surprised to see that you you had control of things? Yeah, it's pretty great, the setup. I mean, it's nice to have the screen off on the side and the one in front of the camera. So, you know, you're looking at the camera, but you're also able to see your slides. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a, quite a bit to going on here. Um, we've really upgraded the studio. This is uh, just like Cairo, King, Como. Uh, the same uh, conveniences are here. Um, I've been through those studios. I've actually built other television studios, so this is not new to me. Um, a lot of fun. Um, One of the things I wondered about was that when I'm presenting, I tend to read. I mean, it's nice if you can just talk about it, but I tend to read my slide. And my eyesight's not real great, and I try to use... You guys had, some of you had really tiny print you were still able to see it on that monitor? Yes, and, and, and I, I quite honestly, I know that there are some of you who noticed I went through your slides and expanded your fonts prior to the, to the operation, especially a couple of those slides were so small, I just didn't see how in the world you were gonna be able to read them. Um, I did quite a bit of work on Evans. However, he sent me a last minute new deck, so he wound up having uh, no enhancements at all. And he was reading like a bullet. He was <laughs> I was amazed. Work. Just amazing to uh, be able to see that, that um, uh, text and everything. Uh, we, had, we had an extra uh, participant on camera here. <laughs> <laughs> Coco came down to visit. Um, so, um, I want to bring up one more thing. Um, Caleb is going to be out of town on vacation. Our alternate is not going to be available. So I am accepting, um, uh, applications for volunteers, uh, to fill in. Caleb, what dates are you going to be, uh, out of town again? Uh, it's the next four weeks. It's quite a, quite a bit of time. Uh, okay. I think till... Uh, I'm going to be back by April 19th, so I think, what is, April 18th, I think, uh, until April 16th is the last Friday that I'm not going Okay, so if you're interested in coming in and wearing a marshmallow seat, suit and being seen on camera, the benefits are, if you, if you get captured on one of these videos that gets published um, in your marshmallow suits, uh, that's kind of a plus because you can talk about the fact that... Uh, you are a part of a, a hybrid learning environment um, in a technological environment like no other. Um, I think this is going to have some interesting uh, repercussions down the road because what we're doing is clearly experimental. Um, we're going to be uh, doing some press releases later this year. Um, Anyway, it's an opportunity for you to spend a month here at Northwest Nuclear, hands-on, working uh, with the other team members. Uh, send me an email. Tell me that you uh, want to get involved, and I'll reach out to you. Okay. Um, we're going to finish up tonight on, um, on our, uh, yeah, whatever you call it. Um, Right COVID now. blaster. COVID blaster. All right. So um, we're we're going to uh, take a minute and uh, switch some cameras around, and I'll be back up here. Vacation or competition, Caleb? 
Uh, we're just going down to visit my grandpa. He got vaccinated and he's kind of... Great. Excited. Great. Oh. I've had a, a number of students who would be gone for a while and they'd come back and I'd ask what was going on. And, oh, I was just competing in a national piano competition or something like that. Uh, one girl that I had once I asked her, I, I just said, well, okay, well, you know, you were gone for a, a week. What was happening? And she said, well, I did a Levi's commercial. I got paid 10000 for the shoot and I get uh, another thousand every time it airs and it's an international Levi's jeans commercial. And I said, you know, for that, I think I'd have been gone for a week too. And the weird thing about it was she had beautiful red hair that was so long she, would, she could sit on it. And the commercial was done in black and white. Okay, we're uh, back here with the um, COVID blaster, and uh, some things have uh, have evolved. Uh, what we've done was we've gotten rid of the excess wire, trimmed it down, and we've soldered all the connections, and then we've taped them down to the machine itself. So this is preparatory to doing a wrap. The next thing we're going to do here is a shrink wrap. And this is just a good old um, shrink wrap that you get in a, in a packing uh, environment. And we're going to take this shrink wrap. Honestly, that is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And we're gonna we're just gonna go around this device many many times, shrink wrapping the wiring and everything underneath it up against the tube. Now, in order to do this, um. It can't be sitting on this device. So we've got to have some people come up here and hold on to this thing. Um, and what I'm thinking is um, I'm going to have Evan and Caleb come up here. And we'll try to get you hooked up here. And uh, I'll show you what I want you guys to do. You're going to basically lift this up. We're going to pull the sawhorse away. And um, you guys are going to hold this while Christina and Caitlin come up and they're going to pass the spool back and forth while they wrap this thing end to end several times until we get enough layers of plastic on this to firmly pack everything down. Anyone not have any questions? Okay, sounds sounds doable. Okay, uh, the only question we're going to have here is 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 how we hook everybody up. Carl, are there any parts there that are not permanently attached that when they're holding it up, it could separate and drop? We're fine um, as long as we get this wrapping on it. Everything will be great. Okay. So um, when you pick it up, nothing's going to fall off. So I'm going to. I'm going to move over to another air handler. Free up some air handlers and we'll get Evan and Caleb up here first who are going to elevate this thing. Okay. I want And Evan, I'm going to put you on this one.
Okay, we're going to get all tangled up in the hoses before this is over. That's part of the fun. You're going to see a hose dance. Um, so, uh, Christina, why don't you come up first? Okay, Caitlin. I need you right over here on this side. Okay. Okay, everybody got air. Okay. So, Evan and Caleb, I want you I want you to grab this at, at the curve of the nozzle and just pick it straight up. Okay? And hold on to it. It's not real heavy. And what we're going to do is I'm going to go just keeping tension on it, pass it over to her. She's going to keep tension on it. She's going to roll it around. Bring it back to me. You know, this time you're going to grab it and you and Caitlin are going to pass it back and forth and just take it right on down. You're going to go over the switches. You're going to go over everything. Nice and tight. Lots of overlap. You're not going to use up too much plastic. We're going to be really generous about this. Now, if we're wrapping this thing in plastic, how are those ballasts going to remain cool? Does anyone have a suggestion? Because we're sealing that heat in, right? Anyone have a thought about that? Nothing, huh? Okay. Well, the secret is this device is designed to operate with a thousand cubic feet a minute of air rushing through its core that air is going to cool the pipe and the ballasts are firmly seated against the pipe. So the, it's a air cooled from the inside, not the outside. Now I want you to actually come out over the edge of that nozzle a little bit and then I want you to very slowly go back down the whole length of the thing in the other direction. How are you and uh, how are Evan and Caleb holding up? Are you guys got it? You're good? Okay. Lots of tension right there at the at the ballast uh, where the ballast edge is. Let that plastic grab hold of this thing. What this is, of course, doing is it's sealing in the wire, and I could have gotten colored wrap. Um, I think purple and orange were two of the obvious colors um, offered on Amazon, but I went with clear 
because it is a prototype and we want we want people to be able to see how the circuits are connected so that this this approach will allow us number one to seal everything up and make it a nice tight package and yet yeah when you come down here come on over the come out over the end do several wraps out here and then start back the other direction and we're going to go down down again When they get to the other end this time, we'll we'll break it off. You guys are doing a fantastic job. It's exactly what we wanted. You realize this thing is waterproof now. Okay, stop right there. Just hold it up. And go ahead and pull that up and pat it down really nice and tight. Rub it in. Now, I want you to rotate it around, guys, till the switches are up top. And then set her back down. Now, okay. Now, um, who's good with razor blades? Woo! We have a volunteer. Okay, so uh, we're going to use about that much razor. Okay, and um, I want you to know, I bought my first aid kit. It's full <laughs> of band-aids and all kinds of other things and stuff that uh, we can stop uh, all kinds of bleeding. So you're safe. Yeah, right. What I want you to do is I want you to go around the switch, each one of these switches the way I am here, and I want you to cut that top layer of plastic off. How tight do you want it? Like how close to the switch? See, see how it's, and from the looks of it, we'll probably just go straight down like this and go all around okay and that then the plastic will actually settle down to the base of the switches there goes the waterproofing yeah but it was fun while it lasted <laughs> Now I could have left this, the plastic on there and we could have operated the switches with the plastic on, but we want people to be able to see the markings clearly. Oh, 
Okay, so now the switches are exposed. Your next challenge, because we're not done, is I want you to take this guy. We're going to extend about that much of the razor. And we're just going to make a slit right here. And we're going to go right around this guy and cut a nice edge without cutting the wires. Okay, and you go all the way around. See what you're missing out on. See, the purpose of a prototype is to test form, fit, and function. So we've reached a place with this design where we have what we want in terms of the form. It connects to, and it has the necessary nozzles for, its interconnection to the air system. It has the necessary um, light output to do the job that we need to do, which is sterilize the airflow for 150 students. Okay? So now we need to stabilize it and then make some measurements. So tonight we'll be making some measurements. Go all the way around. Okay, now slit right here. We should be able to peel that off as a band. Perfect. Now we're going to do the same thing on the other end. And the reason that we're doing that is because that leaves these end caps free so we could, if necessary, remove them and service the lamps inside. If we left this sealed, then if a lamp burns out, we have no way to service it. You got a problem? Ah, okay, so we're going to work around him because he's actually got to come out there. So go ahead and cut both directions. And when we get ready to peel him off, that's just where the power wire comes out. Okay, so this is where the power cord comes out. We'll just leave that there. And I'm going to pivot this towards the camera. And I'm going to uh, go ahead and fire it up at the camera. So as the camera looks into this thing, okay, look right down the nozzle. You can see all the bulbs inside are all illuminated. Okay, pretty cool. Now, on the journey to making a prototype, you got to do your paperwork. 
So one of the pieces of paperwork that we're going to show you tonight is this is the system specification. Okay? And you'll see some things like length the length is 36 inches, the radius is 3 inches, the volume is 1018 cubic inches, and we're pushing down at the bottom 1060 cubic feet a minute. And we're going to be able to support 150 students and we are hitting the airstream with 3.16 millijoules of dose of UVC radiation. On top of that, here are the instructions that we've followed in assembling this thing. And last of all, very important, this is a costed bomb bill of materials that shows all of the various parts and the total cost, $485.18. That's what it costs to build this thing. Okay, so we know the cost, we know the specifications, we know the assembly instructions. Those are some things that if somebody walks up to this and starts asking questions, you've got to have some paperwork to talk about it. There's also some background information on UVC radiation ad hoc over overall that you need to know and how resistant COVID is to it, how resistant the flu is to it. Um, this device will actually, as Rishi pointed out, um, sanitize, sterilize airflow for hospitals of all diseases. So, I mean, it pretty much wipes out everything. And uh, there's a good reason for that. So, Carl, Carl, do we also have to know the number of hours of labor to assemble this? Do, do we offer... Have you tracked how much time was spent? I, ha I have a, a, a rough guesstimate. Okay. Based on the fact that... Okay. This is a... Um, a UVC testing device. Um, and we're going to use it to measure the output of this uh, unit. Um, and it comes with a wand and a meter. It also comes with something else that makes it very expensive. It comes with a certificate of calibration. This is a calibrated device so that we can write um, authentic engineering papers around measurements taken uh, from it because um, if you can't show the pedigree for your calibrations on any kind of instrumentation that you're doing you're dead in the water so buying a cheap meter um, Sometimes it's a path to nowhere. Uh, this one was spendy. Um, I am going to ask Caitlin to monitor the output. And I'm going to turn it on here. And being very careful with my hand, I'm going to stick the probe in here for short periods of time because this thing pumping out a lot of radiation. So this is all 10 bulbs. And I'm just going to stick this thing in face up. What do you got? 8, 7. Just keep going up. Is it going up? Okay, and do you know why it might be going up? Anyone have a guess? It's continuously, so um, that would 
there as well. Well, what's happening here is that once we switched on the bowl, the plasma is heating. And as that plasma heats, these bulbs put out more and more total lumens. And so we're waiting for the bulbs to warm up. It actually takes a while for them to reach peak operating uh, parameter. Um, I was doing this earlier, and I want you to know my gloves started to stink. It literally started decomposing my glove. <laughs> These things also kick out a heck of a lot of ozone. Okay, so we're going to take another look. Oops! What does it say? It says hi. Hi. In other words, we just exceeded the capacity of this thing to measure it. Now, what do we do? Well, we have this handy dandy power switches. So what we're going to do is we're going to shut off all but four lamps. And I'm going to stick this in here with four lamps on. What do you got there? 5520-ish. Okay. So you got 5, 520. Now these are round numbers, but what you've got is 5.5 millijoules of radiation. 5.5. Let me measure from the other side. about the same right yeah okay so how do we think about this that's four bulbs okay so that's theoretically 40 percent of the output so if 5.5 is only 40%, then 11 millijoules would be 80%, right? And if 5.5 is 40, then 2.25 is 20. So add that 2.25 to the 11 millijoules, and you have 13.5 millijoules. You with me? 13.25. 13.25. So the output is 13.25, right? wrong. You know why? Look at my detector. What do you notice about it? It's only detecting on one side. Exactly. Spot on. So how much energy am I measuring? Much less, right? Because there's reflective all over the inside. Absolutely. We've got the inside of this thing covered with foil, and we have bulbs on the bottom and the top. We're only measuring half the energy. So if it's 13.25, that makes it 26.5. Okay, so that's 26.5 rough estimate. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this off. 
excuse me, 26.25 millijoules per centimeter squared across the entire interior surface. That is a lot of radiation. So now you can begin to understand at 26.25 why we can run um, that much air through this thing and it brings us down according to the sheet to about three millijoules of energy per square centimeter. Now that was my design criteria, three millijoules per centimeter. Why? Well, what does it take to kill 90% of us COVID culture? It takes 500 microjoules. So how much more is three millijoules than 500 microjoules? Tell me. Millie, micro, nano, pico? Come on. David's telling me it's six. Correct. Six. It's six times more radiation than is necessary to wipe out 90% of a COVID culture. So do you think we got that last 10%? Yeah, I think we did. I think we pretty well toasted it. That's the design criteria. Okay, so now we know we, we've, we've test flown this thing. The last step is we're gonna put a motor on it and do a wind tunnel test. Make sure that we don't blow the bulbs out of it. Um, we're not gonna do that in the classroom because the books would come off the shelves and there's, yeah. You start playing with a thousand cubic feet a minute, it's a lot of air. So we'll do that next week, but we'll do it in the garage. We'll actually have a wind test out and we'll shoot out the garage door and you can get an idea how much wind speed is coming through this thing. Very successful. Okay. Time check. 20 after. Okay. I'm gonna, see, I'm gonna set some people free here. Caleb, you want to go on back to your chair? Christina. And we didn't spill any blood or anything. I am so impressed. Okay. I didn't know you guys were rappers. I love it. <laughs> okay. We built something. And that's really a tribute to the whole idea of innovation. What have we done? We've taken some sewer pipe, for crying out loud, some automobile accessory switches, some germicidal lights, some ballasts out of fluorescent bathroom fixtures, right? Some furnace tape, and then finally some shrink wrap and we build ourselves a very viable tool in the war against COVID. How do you do that? How do you do that? What do you need to do that? $548.18? Does that sound like a lot of money? And brilliant leadership. 
You need the faith in yourself and in your right to challenge the situation, even though you don't have the pretty sheepskin on the wall, the faith to go do something that no one else is doing and innovate in ways that other people have never thought about the problem. And the problem is, if I sat down and I told people, hey, I'm going to take some sewer pipe and a bunch of fluorescent uh, germicidal lights and some tubes and some automobile switches and we're going to build a thing that actually uh, kills COVID. How many people would have believed me? How many people would have believed I would even get this far? How many people would have encouraged me? What's the lesson? If you're going to be an inventor, inventor, if you're going to be an innovator, if you're going to create new technology, you have got to be willing to do unorthodox science. You have got to be willing to try unorthodox ideas. And I'm here to tell you from inside Microsoft, I see people ordering stuff that you would never believe would come through the door and they would experiment and use it as, as part of something scientific. But the pattern we're following here is the same thing that's happening in companies around the world. And that's why being creative and being imaginative and not letting other people throw cold water on your ideas. The, the green monster is always looking for somebody to um, upstage, okay? Don't play into that game. If you've got a good idea and you believe in your heart that it's worth pursuing, you know what? You need to pursue that idea. Do you know why you need to pursue it? Because you'll learn as much pursuing your idea as you would going to school anywhere. And all those lessons, even if your idea doesn't pan out, play into the next invention and the next invention and the next invention. And you don't realize it, but failure after failure after failure, you're building a success. You're building a success because you're putting layer upon layer upon layer of skills and insight into material science and into technology so that when you get to the place where you can innovate on this scale, take what is apparently over-the-counter junk and make a medical device with it, that, hey, um, it's going to be something that comes natural to you. You'll have the confidence. You won't doubt in yourself that you can pull it off. Even if you don't know where you're going when you start out. When I first started out, what, back in March, when all this began, I don't know if you remember, but I had this long pole. And on the end of the pole, there was a, a, a halide light bulb. And I turned on my light bulb and I made this really bright light, which was only a tiny fraction of the UVC this thing puts out. Just, a, just an absolute fraction of what this does. But I wasn't afraid to take a broom pole and a bunch of cord and a halide light and put this thing together and try my idea. And when I actually bought a measuring device and looked at how much UVC that was coming out of it, I realized that, hey, that device, it's not going to be powerful enough to do what we need to do. It's not going to get us there. So I got to change my idea. And I've been looking for different kinds of bulbs. 
and I knew my bulbs had to be readily available, cheap. Um, you should be able to get them from several sources because we want a solution that's widely available, something that people are going to be able to use. Um, somebody might say, gee whiz, Carl, the vaccines are here now. Is this still going to be valuable? Yes. For the reason that Rishi pointed out, because this fights more than just COVID. It also, if you're working in a biological warfare unit or any other kind of a, a serious uh, uh, biological engineering uh, environment, this makes excellent sense. Therefore, we're going to implement this per permanently um, when we're working with live cultures in the fume hood um, or, or biological col cultures in the biological lab, like uh, um, what was the name of that virus that we genetically engineered? Um, we did? Yeah, we, we genetically, we uh, used CRISPR-Cas9 to change the genetic makeup I mean, it's bacteria. Of a bacteria yeah. and make it resistant to penicillin. And yeah. for an experiment like that, we'll have this as a backup to offer a more robust safety environment, the same you would have in any, any genetic engineering lab. So um, kind of a neat story. Okay, um, we're uh, we're going to end a little early tonight, but I'm uh, I want to take a few minutes and I want to talk about something called face to face. Uh, I'm hoping everybody had a chance to see my video on. Um, uh, so sociatrophy. Uh, that I invented that word. I, I hope you know that that wasn't actually. Go home, look it up in your Webster's. You won't find it. I, I invented it. I, I published it out, and so I'm now calling it an official word. And I'm trying to get everybody to adopt my new word um, because it is spot on in representing what's really happening. Explains, explains completely what we're up against. Um, I was talking to one of the one of our fellow classmates, who shall remain nameless, and uh, you know he was telling me that uh, hey you know he had been away from uh, class for a little bit because he got himself a new job, and uh, I don't know the exact circumstances, but um, he had uh, come out of hibernation and gone back to work, and he really felt like an alien. He didn't know how uh, to think about being face to face with other people again. It was, it was really kind of strange. Um, think these skills don't go away, but anything you don't do long enough, like if you just sit in an office chair all day long, you're going to find out really quick that it hurts to go up and down stairs. And if you don't pay attention, you could wind up um, in a rehab unit with somebody making you do knee, deep knee bends. So... <laughs> Um, we have to pay attention to our, our physical and emotional uh, strength. Um, there are going to be some casualties coming out of this, and I, I predict that it will be talked about substantially after the fact. We're not hearing anything now, but as people begin to come out, back out of the cave and discover limitations 
that have set in while they've been in hibernation, um, it's going to be a surprise. It's going to catch everybody a little off guard. Um, so what does that mean to us? What does that what does that mean for Northwest Nuclear? What does it mean for you as students? Um, we are pushing the camera because if we don't, and no one else does, we're, there's going to be a gap when the lights come on, so to speak. And it's not far away. Um, what are the plans uh, as far as high school opening up? Has anyone communicated anything to you regarding when you guys will actually be going back to class? Go ahead, Evan. So from what I understand, um, at least from my district, they're given the option to go back to school, but it's not going to be opened up, I think, to the last, like, I think, like, six to eight weeks of school. So you, you'd be going back in, like, the like the last six to eight weeks of school. So a lot of people just aren't going to do it because they just, they've been online for so long that it seems kind of know, dumb to go back for such a short amount of time. Okay, so you're you're thinking that that high school will be pretty much um, shut down for the rest of the year. From what I get, yeah, a lot of people that I know, I, I also I don't know this like for everybody. Yeah. But for the people I know, a lot of people are just gonna stay home. Okay. They're, yeah, they're given, they're given the option. They sent like a survey, and they said like, do you want to go back to school or do you not want to go back to school? Okay. Okay. Christina, what about you? You're in, I know you're in a private school. Yeah, we've been back for doing hybrid for a month now. And I think a lot of the other smaller private schools in the Seattle area have been doing that as well. Okay. What do you mean when you say hybrid? So I go two days a week. Okay. So in federal way, they're, they're calling their program hybrid, but it's with no students. They're, all the students are online. Okay. But it was announced yesterday that Federal Way is going to now start having uh, certain grades, uh, lower level, like kindergarten through second, third, something like that, and special ed students and special circumstance students that will be coming on campus. However, I was told today that that's only going to be for asynchronous time. In Federal Way, Synchronous time means classroom time. Asynchronous, you go and talk. Uh, you go online and talk to your teacher individually to get extra help. And they, so they'll have it that the people can actually come in face to face with their teachers. Uh, I know that in, uh, in elementary, they're already back for public. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm actually. My focal is obviously high school, so um, I'm looking at impact uh, to your high school education, and uh, this is year two, so essentially March to the end of last year, and all of this year, um, have, now we've got some seniors here. Um, have you, seen any communication regarding impact to your college applications or um, regarding the thinking around how, how colleges are thinking about the quality of education you got while you were um, away from the physical school? Um, is there anyone going on record saying how the colleges are looking at this? The biggest change that I've noticed is standardized testing. Um, they have pretty much eliminated a lot of the requirements surrounding that. Um, and I mean, they still have some, but they're going, starting to not take that as seriously, which led to a huge increase in the number of applications that colleges were receiving. So like deadlines for finding out whether or not you got in were pushed back in a lot of cases. And yeah, so. A lot of people applied to a lot of schools because the they thought, why not? There's no 
uh, standardized testing app, you know, requirements. So. Interesting. I know uh, a lot of the Ivy League schools. I think um, the, the 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 latest ones have pushed it back to like June or something for their decisions. Okay. Caitlin, are you a senior? No. Oh, okay. Um, Caleb, I got you both. Another year at least. <laughs> okay. Well, um, it's been a tough ride from my side of the train too. I want to go on record and say that when we tackled this, we, we hoped we could overcome the COVID problem quickly with this uh, magic technology and go back to the labs and do what we were doing. It just didn't work that way. It was just too much complicated uh, technology that had to be put in, in the right way. We didn't want, if even one person got sick as a result of this experiment, quote unquote, um, it could have long range impacts on everything we were doing. It was necessary for us to be right on this the first time around. That meant we had to do a lot of extra studying, a lot of extra research, a lot of extra consulting. Um, there's a ton of government paperwork, LNI paperwork, state paperwork that goes along with this. Um, I literally start at 2.30 to 3 o'clock in the afternoon getting ready for one of these sessions. And our air testing unit over there, which is live and being monitored by radio and all the rest of the things that, that have to be done. All the battery units have to be, have fresh batteries put in them. Um, there's a lot that goes on staging and getting ready for this two hours. And then while we're in these suits, there's, there's some encumbrance. But we have done more than we imagined we could. We've done some really serious biological science. We've done some good mechanical engineering and uh, fabrication. We've done some innovation. So this year has not been stagnant. It's, it's, it's been profitable. Uh, it wasn't what I'd hoped it would be. We didn't spend as much time with the reactors I wanted and we didn't come out with a white paper that I wanted to very badly. But um, there, we, we ran into complications that we just couldn't circumnavigate. That said, um, I am very interested in having some feedback from all students, seniors included. I know you guys are moving on, but if you could give me reflections on 2020, tell me what it was you wanted to do, didn't get to do, um, feel we should have done differently. Um, I'd like to hear that. Also, anything that we did right. If you think there are things about our program that are still um, groundbreaking, that set us apart from the rest of the pack. I'd love to hear that too. Um, we want to learn from this year as much as we can and, and apply it going forward. And I recognize that that's going to be, um, it's, it's a challenge. So um, I need the input. I'm asking you to, you know, take the time to, to provide it because uh, we'll take it seriously. Um, and when you get one of these these uh, programs running, the only way the only way you can grow is by learning from your mistakes, and that means paying attention to critical input and advice, and um, so understand that anything you say is not going to get kicked under the table. We'll take it very seriously, look at it very carefully, 
figure out how best to respond. Um, between now and the end of the year, we've got some some more goodness planned. Um, it's not going to get um, any the less uh, calm. One of the things that uh, my wife and I um, have decided to do, uh, we're going to have some um, intelligent design sessions and we're going to have some other kinds of, of uh, trainings going on um, very, very soon. Uh, part of that training will uh, probably be taking place upstairs. Um, in order to make that uh, possible for everybody, um, we've decided to put in a wheelchair lift. So we're putting an elevator into uh, uh, our mix here. Uh, it actually is already ordered. The mechanical drawings are in hand and uh, we're going to be installing it in, in early April. And so people who are handicapped uh, will find that the labs are handicapped accessible and we're going to have uh, handicap uh, uh, areas upstairs. The ham shack is going to be open so people can go in there and run the ham radios. Um, we've got some new antennas planned so um, all of that's going to be um, I think a lot of fun right after the month of April. So May and June should should wind up being a, a good way to close out the year. Um, hopes Hope the seniors hang around for it. I know it gets uh, towards the end of the year and depending on activities. However, if the prom winds up not happening or <clears throat> or some of the other uh, things don't pan out, um, we'll have activities here, I assure you. Um, that pretty well covers everything I've got. Dave, do you have anything? The only thing is to remind all the people online your presentation is due Wednesday to Carl. Send it, please, to cgren at microsoft.com. But those need to be sent to him by Wednesday so that he can get them ready for you to present on Friday.